Hello students, um, my name is Dr. Omide and this is a continuation of our lecture on the spinal cord. So we are going to discuss, we'll begin with the organization of the of, um, spinal nerves. So we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves and um, spinal nerves are formed by the union of a dorsal root which is sensory and a ventral root which is motor. The spinal nerve later divides into a dorsal and ventral uh, dorsal and ventral rami which convey both sensory and motor impulses for the muscles and skin of the respective parts so um, the spinal nerve is mixed motor and sensory so it will divide into a dorsal rami to innervate muscles and skin of the dorsal aspect and ventral rami that in innervates muscles and skin on the ventral aspect in the lower cervical and lumbar sacral regions, the ventral rami will form the brachial plexus to innervate the upper limbs, while the lumbar sacral region will form lumbar sacral plexus to innervate the lower limb. So this is just to show you, this is the cross section of the spinal cord. You have ventral root and dorsal root together will form a spinal nerve that immediately divides into a ventral rami to innervate skin and muscles of the um, anterior part of the body, while dorsal rami carrying both motor and sensory to the dorsal aspect of uh, the trunk. Then you have um, the ventral rami at the lumbar, cervical and lumbosacral area will go form plexus that will innervate the upper limb, that's the brachial plexus at the cervical region and lumbosacral region to form a plexus to innervate the lower limb. So that shows you the ventral rootlets will join to form a ventral root the dorsal rootlets will join to form a sensory dorsal root whose cell bodies are in the dorsal root ganglia. So dorsal root and ventral root join and form a spinal nerve and spinal nerve immediately divides into a ventral rami and dorsal rami and each of these rami is carrying um, motor and sensory uh, components. Again that just shows you the spinal uh, nerve has divided into a dorsal rami to innervate muscles and skin on the dorsum and ventral rami to innervate muscle and skin on the ventral aspect. Then we have what we call the rami communicantes. These bend anteriorly to the visceral organs, as you can see there. So what are the functional components of a spinal nerve? So we have what we call general somatic efferent. Efferent means coming from the CLS. So these are motor to the skeletal muscle. The moment you see somatic, most of the time it's skeletal muscle. So general somatic efferent it's motor to skeletal muscles and the neurons are in the ventral horn. Then we have general visceral efferent. So these are autonomic. Visceral will go to smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and glands. So general visceral efferent are autonomic uh, visceral motor to smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and glands. And these neurons reside in the intermediolateral cell column. Then we have the uh, axons where you have the preganglionic sympathetic nerves that join spinal nerve forming the white communicating remus and these preganglionic sympathetic nerves are at T1 to L3 level while the parasympathetic are at S1 to S2. General somatic afferent. Afferent means carrying information to the CNS to the spinal cord so that's sensory. So sensory from somatic tissue that's muscles, skin and joints and the cell bodies are in the dorsal root ganglia while the central process enters the dorsal horn. While general visceral afferent, afferent is sensory, viscera, visceral means from viscera smooth muscle, cardiac muscle and glands. So they accompany uh, the general visceral efferent but eventually split to go to the dorsal horn via the dorsal root ganglion. So again that just shows you the somatic uh, sensory somatic motor so then that's visceral motor and visceral sensory. So the visceral ones are towards the uh, uh, middle portion of the uh, gray matter, while somatic are at the extreme um, end. So we have various clinical correlates. There could be spread of malignancy to the central nervous system. That means to the through the spinal cord, because we have valveless venous connections between the external segmental veins and the inter internal vertebral venous plexus. Remember the internal vertebral venous plexus are the epidural venous plexus. So we have the uh, prostate, breast and thyroid cancer usually are uh, spread to the vertebral column and into the spinal cord 
through this communication from uh, external vertebral plexus to the internal vertebral plexus then to the spinal cord. Then how do you localize spinal cord lesion? So you can localize by testing um, for loss of cutaneous sensation. So you ask your patient to close their eyes, then you use something smooth like a piece of cotton wool and you uh, put it on one region, let's say, of the arm. You ask the, uh, uh, tell the patient to tell you whenever they feel anything. So if they have loss of cutaneous sensation, they will not communicate anything. But the region where sensation is intact, they will tell you they can feel that you touch them with something um, fine. Then we have reflex uh, contraction of muscles that will help you localize lesion at the spinal cord. So you can test the biceps brachii. So when you um, use your uh, patella hammer and hit onto the biceps tendon, if there will be a reflex, then you know that C5, C6 is intact. intact. The triceps brachii reflex will help you test C6, C7 to C8 while the quadriceps uh, femoris uh, reflex at the patella tendon tests L2 to L4, and the gastrocnemius reflex, when you stroke on the uh, calcaneal tendon, you're able to assess S1, S2 reflex. So the reflex pathway has various um, components, and reflexes generally are usually protective, and they occur at the spinal cord end. Brainstem. That's where integration of reflexes occurs at the spinal cord or brainstem level. And there can be monosynaptic or many synapsing of nerves may be involved. So you require a stimulus at the receptor. So for example, if you're going to be pricked by a thorn or a pin, that's the stimulus. And then you need to relay that sensory information using an afferent nerve. So this is the this is the sensory nerve that's carrying that information after you've been pricked on your skin. So the cell body of this nerve is in the dorsal root ganglion. So that information, so this is what you call the first order neuron. Then first order neuron is going to relay at the dorsal horn onto a second order neuron, which is called a relay neuron. And this will communicate with a third order neuron at the ventral horn. And ventral horn is motor. So the nerve will exit through the ventral root to the spinal nerve and cause the muscle to contract. So when you step on a pin, Immediately, that information will be carried by uh, a primary uh, first order neuron whose cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion, seen up with cell body of second order neuron whose cell body is in the dorsal horn, and that will seen up with third order neuron whose cell body is in the ventral horn. And this is a motor neuron that will cause muscle to uh, contract and make you withdraw from the uh, uh, stimulus of pain. So, we can ask you what are the components of a reflex arc. So you need uh, the stimulus, the receptor, the sensory nerve. You tell me where the cell body is at the dorsal root ganglion. Second order neuron, where is the cell body at the dorsal horn? Third order neuron, where is the cell body at the ventral horn? And what is the effector? An effector can be a muscle or a gland. It could be a gland so that you cause a gland to secrete and cause a response. Then we have what you call lumbar puncture, is whereby a needle is inserted into the subarachnoid space in the lumbar region. Remember I showed you the lumbar system. So the indications of lumbar puncture is so that you're able to obtain CSF for diagnosis of conditions like meningitis, or when you want to introduce drugs like anesthetics or dyes. So um, when you do a lumbar puncture, the, you, you can ask you to list the order of structures that are traversed by the needle during lumbar puncture. So you start with skin, followed by subcutaneous tissue, then thoracolumbar fascia, before you get to supraspinous ligament, then through interspinous ligament, then you enter the epidural space, then dura mater, and then below the uh, dura, you have the subdural space before you get to arachnoid mater, and then uh, subarachnoid space. So this is how you position the patient before you do lumbar puncture. Then lumbar puncture is always uh, done, is usually done at L3 level. So you palpate the iliac crest and then that gives you the level of L4 vertebra. So you go above the L4 vertebra, that will be L3 region, L3, L4 boundary. That's where you do your lumbar puncture. And this is the needle going through skin, subcutaneous layer, thoracolumbar fascia, supraspinous ligament, then interspinous ligament between the spines of the vertebra before you get to epidural space, dura mater, subdural space, arachnoid mater. This is the this is the epidural from 
supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament. This is ligamentum flavum, okay? Ligamentum flavum. After ligamentum flavum, you get to epidural space, then subdural space, arachnid space, then subarachnid space. That's where you collect your CSF. So skin, superficial fascia, thoracolumbar fascia, then supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligamentum flavum, epidural space, dura, subdural space, arachnoid, subarachnoid space, that's where your CSF is. So vascular lesions, we had discussed the area of the spinal cord supplied by anterior spinal artery. We said it's the anterior two-thirds, so it will supply uh, the ventral horns, the lateral horns, the ventral column, and the lateral column. So when you have occlusion of anterior spinal artery, these regions will have um, an effect. So um, corticospinal tracts that are usually on the lateral and anterior part, as well as spinothalamic tracts that are usually on the anterior and lateral columns will be affected. So we'll ask you, what are the clinical features of anterior spinal artery occlusion? So there will be bilateral lower motor neuronal deficits, bilateral upper motor neuron deficits and sensory deficits uh, of pain and temperature. So you'll get to understand this in the subsequent lectures when we are going to discuss uh, the tracts. So after we've discussed the tracts, you come back to this lecture and try and figure out why would somebody have bilateral lower motor neuronal deficits or upper motor neuronal deficits. Then we have Coda Equina syndrome. So Coda Equina at the lower um, sacral coccygeal nerves and we say it, it, it's uh, the nerves together forming what resembles a tail of a horse because the spinal cord has terminated earlier and the nerves need, need to live through their corresponding intervertebral species that's how cordae equina forms so when there's compression of cordae equina most of the time by a herniated intervertebral disc there'll be we'll ask you what are the features of cordae equina syndrome we have low back pain bilateral lower limb pain with motor and sensory deficits. Remember those are sacral nerves going to the lower limb and the perineum. So you will also have perineal sensory and motor deficits with genitourinary uh, dysfunction with overflow incontinence or retention as well as fecal incontinence. Poliomyelitis is caused by a virus and this virus usually attacks the anterior horn motor neurons. So Usually, it can cause death when there's paralysis of respiratory muscles. And remember, polio enters the body uh, through fecal oral transmission. So in the next lecture, we'll discuss the pathways, ascending and descending pathways. Thank you very much.